morning, everybody. Please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Last time, we had looked at how the husband is to be towards the wife, and we saw that the Lord emphasizes how he is to be, and how is that? The husband is to love his wife. We saw that three times, as we're going to read in our text this morning. In Ephesians 5, 25, 28, and 33, it says that the hus husband is to love his wife. It also says that in Colossians chapter 3, verse 19, the Lord places a high value on love. We see that through the scriptures, we understand that. The first nine parts of the fruit of the Spirit, the first of the nine parts is love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a chapter devoted to, to love, it gives us faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of them is clearly said to be love. In John 3.16, the Father giving His only Son so that sinners would not perish but have eternal life, that is called an act of love. And we are told to love everyone, even including our own enemies. Jesus said the greatest commandment in the law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus said on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. So on these two, love God, love people. A high priority is placed upon love. God even calls himself love. Scriptures say God is love. And the husband's primary responsibility to his wife is to love her. We can understand that. That makes sense. But interestingly, as we know what we're going to deal with today, interestingly, that's not the case with the wife. The Lord doesn't emphasize to wives that she is to love her husband, even though she is supposed to love her husband. But the Lord repeatedly tells the wife to submit to her husband, a word that's not liked today. A word that our flesh does not like, and if even Christians struggle with this word, how much more those who do not name the name of Christ, those who do not love, love God's word. They don't like this word submission, especially when we've seen how we could say Islam handles submission and how male chauvinism handles submission. It's done wrongfully, so there is going to be a, a rejection to that in the world. So we want to look at this in a, in a correct, a biblical way. So let's read verses 22 through 33. Most of this text deals with how the husband is to be, but this is the text. I am also going to go to the other, other popular passages about how women are to be towards their, their husbands in the New Testament because there is so little information in this text we have here today about for the wives. So starting in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let us pray. Father, we, we thank you for your word, and, and we just thank you for, for giving us your word, for this privilege of having your words to us, your instruction to us, so we can know how we are to, how, how we're, we're to live as believers, to serve you, to love you, and even to, to serve our own husbands and wives and children and families and how we are to be in the church. You have given us so much instruction. Help us to handle it wisely and rightly, dear Lord. Help us not to use it for our own manipulative purposes, but to be honest and truthful with it, even when it's difficult for us to, to receive it. 
So Lord, we just pray that you would help us now as we look at your word. Please guide me in the things I say. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So there are three verses here that say that wives are to submit to their own husbands. Verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Verse 24, it says, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And then verse 33, Let the wife see that she respects her husband. So we have in verses 22 and 24, she is to submit to him and be subject to him. Those, are, those come from the same Greek word. And then we have in verse 33 that she is to respect him. This is a, a different Greek word. It is uh, something like phobitei. And we understand the word phobia comes from that. We see this word, this Greek word translated in the scriptures as, as fear or to be afraid. So with this word here, there's really a sense where the Lord tells wives to fear their husbands. Some translations say that the wife is to reverence her husband instead of respect. And when we're told to fear the Lord, we can, I, we can understand that there is this idea that we are to respect the Lord. According to the New King James, as what we're looking at in our study, these three verses say that the wife is to submit to her husband, to be subject to her husband, and to respect her husband. So I don't want to bore you with definitions, but this could be helpful to us to submit. I'm going to define these terms, and they kind of overlap, of course is to surrender or to yield oneself in any way to the power, the will, authority, or the control of another, to give up resistance, to resign, to acquiesce, or to yield without murmuring. That was the way he defined it. To subject is to be placed or situated under, being under the power and dominion of, a, of another, to be submissive or obedient. A subject is one who is under the power, control, influence, or observation of someone, and then respect, it's a bit different. It is to regard, esteem, honor, and revere. The word respect, it was an interesting word to me in its etymology. In, the word respect literally means to look back upon. It's to notice with special attention. From the Latin, re is back, and spect is the same word we get our word spectacles from. So the idea is that you look back upon that Thing or that person that you think is worthy of your attention. You could see a group of people. And the one that you notice, the one that you stare upon, the one that you, that you look directly upon for whatever reason, that is the idea. You're, that, that person has your attention and, and you're looking upon that person because of something you see there. It, it could be with a degree of reverence. But whatever it is, that thing that you're respecting, that you're looking back upon, is, is worthy of your attention. So you may have heard your mother or father say something like, look at me when I speak to you. Or you may have said that yourselves. And it's because we understand that when we respect something, we're going to look at that thing that we respect or look at that person that we respect. I've known men at, in, in the workforce who will not look at their supervisors because they don't respect them. So they don't, they don't want to give them their eyes. They don't want to give them their, their, their specific attention. And it's, and it's not because the supervisor is so bad. It's not because the supervisor has done something wrong to them. It's just because these, these adults don't have any respect for authority. And they don't want to show any submission to authority. But that's not the way it is supposed to be with God's people. God calls his people to respect authority. And God calls wives to be submissive or respectful to their husbands. We also see this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. It says the same thing. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Uh, you, you could turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. That's going to be the next text I want to look at. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word. So here again, it says the same thing. Uh, again, repeatedly, wives are to submit to their husbands. But this text right here, is de de dealing specifically with wives of husbands who are difficult, husbands that are harsh, husbands who, are, who are, are rude to them. It says right there, even if some do not obey the word. So this is dealing with, or this is addressing primarily wives who are married to husbands who do not obey the word. 
And right there, we're, we see that the Lord tells wives to submit to husbands, even husbands who don't deserve their respect. So it, it, the, the idea should not be, well, my husband doesn't deserve my respect. My husband is, is not a respect-worthy man. My husband is not someone that, that, shows, that, that causes me to respect him. Because the Lord tells us, tells wives, if that person is your husband, he needs to have your respect even if he's an unbeliever, even if he's a believer who's just continually acting out in a pattern of sin, a, a believer who needs to repent of a particular sin, and, and the wife knows it because she knows him better than anybody, and she is to respect him. Now, I want to caution women not to use this passage right here for any time you think your husband steps out of line. If you're a Christian couple, and then your husband is, is in an argument with you, and you this doesn't mean you automatically go to this passage and you say, okay, well, he's, well, well you're in sin, so you're, you're, you're this, this, this husband right here. This is speaking specifically to wives of husbands who have this pattern of not obeying the word, as it says there. Or they have clearly said they're not believers. So as it says, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. So we see again here this idea of a wife fearing her husband. Of course, this is not implying that the husband is ever allowed to be abusive to his wife, whether it's physical abusiveness or whether it's emotional abusiveness or, or, or verbal abuse. He is never allowed to be abusive to his wife. And we, we understand Verbal abuse can be just as destructive as physical abuse if it's done for a long period of time. You know, that, that saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. There's a sense where that's true. I'd, I'd rather be, be slandered than be killed, you could say in a sense, or it, it be, be violently, violently treated, be physically abused. But words are damaging, especially words over a long period of time are damaging, and, and they can wear upon a person's psyche. We're upon a person's soul, and they, they can go to a place to where a physical punch does not reach as long as those words continue to happen. So husbands are not ever to be physically or even verbally abusive to their wives. So the wife is not to fear her husband because, of, because she's scared of him, that he may hurt her or that he may do something bad to her, but she is called to respect her husband, even fear her husband and the understanding, with the understanding that she is to revere him because of his authoritative place that the Lord has given to him. So let's keep reading there in 1 Peter 3, verse 3. It says, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So in this text, we see that the Lord tells us, the Lord tells wives married to difficult husbands, he tells them the way to, we could say, fix or correct the, the marriage to correct their husbands. And we see how the Lord tells them not to correct their husbands. What, what, what do we see in this text? How the wife is not to correct her husband. What is she not to use? It says, even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, without a word, even those husbands who don't obey the scriptures, who don't obey God's word, the wife is not to use her words to correct her husband. She is not to fix her husband by her rebukes. She is not to, to use her verbal corrections, her verbal instruction to rebuke her husband, to correct her husband. It says, without a word. There in verse 1, that he may be one without a word. And the Lord isn't saying that she doesn't even need to use her words in order to correct him. The Lord is actually telling the wife, do not use your words. But instead, what is she to use? Silence. Well, more than silence. Instead, what is she to use? Conduct. Conduct accompanied by fear. She is to rest upon her godly conduct and trust in the Lord using that to bring about the change in her husband, not her words. 
her godly conduct. And we can imagine that this wife, this is a, a, a Christian woman, this is a believing woman. That's, that's the idea. She's reading the scriptures. But this works whether the person is a believer or not. This is God's word to men and women in a marriage, right? But in this case, here's a Christian woman we can imagine. She probably knows more than her husband about the scriptures. She probably has been devoting herself to the study of the scriptures, scripture memorization. She is probably right in her criticism of her husband in, this, in whatever situation that they're dealing with. She may, mean, she may mean well in wanting to correct her husband. She, as I said, she knows him better than anybody else. And she knows these simple patterns and she knows these errors, that, these blind spots that he may not see or that he may see but doesn't care to, to deal with. But she is not to fix her marriage problems or to correct her husband with her words. It says it here. The Lord didn't design it that way is the thing. And what I think and why the Lord didn't design it that way is that it goes contrary. When the, when, when the wife uses her words to correct her husband, it goes contrary to the design of the Lord giving the, the husband the authoritative place and the wife the submissive role in the marriage. And, and, and so often as the wife uses her words, which sometimes wives can, can easily do and, and do it much better than their own husbands, they actually confuse the role that the Lord has given them in authority and in submission in that, that's supposed to be in the, in the marriage, especially when we see a Christian marriage. So when she uses her words, it goes contrary to the design of the wife submitting to her husband. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that the wife is never to use her words. It doesn't mean that. I want to emphasize that we see that in the scriptures, but it doesn't mean that the wife is never to use her words. If the husband welcomes her instruction, if he makes it clear that she wants her instruction, that, she, that he wants her correction, well, then good for him. And their marriage problems will be fixed sooner rather than, the, than later. But even if the husband doesn't show that he wants her correction, this isn't saying that she never has a voice in the marriage. God has used loving wives to rebuke sinful husbands. And, and she, she can use her words, I would say, if she feels compelled to. Uh, you remember the, the passage where Nehemiah is talking to the king and it says that he prayed to, to, to God as he was talking to him. So as he was dealing with speaking to the king, a, a serious situation, he was praying to the Lord. I would say as, as a wife is, is dealing with her husband and she prays to the Lord for wisdom, and guidance and, and the, I guess you could say the rebuke that she's thinking about giving him, the correction that she's thinking about giving him. If she feels that the Lord is okay with her sharing this rebuke, then I'll say that's fine. If the seriousness of the situation calls for her correction, if it calls for her warning, for her, for her re rebuke to her husband, then that is fine, but that is not to be the norm. That is to be rare. That she doesn't just throw off this, this scriptural example here, this, this scriptural command here for her to not use her words. But she should primarily seek to win her husband by her hum humble and submissive character. Verse 4 says, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So she is to submit to her husband, even if it's difficult but she is to submit to him. And as we see there in verse four, she can be satisfied or encouraged or even motivated by the fact that her submission to her husband is, how does it say there in verse four? That it's very precious in the sight of God. What she is doing, her submission to her husband isn't just directed to her husband and that's it. And then it goes no further. She is actually submitting to her God. She is, or we could say she's submitting to her, through her husband to her God. But she, how she is submitting to her husband, it's, it's really a reflection of her submission to her God. If, if she's not doing it out of faith to God, if it's not her faith in God that enables her to, to submit to her husband, then it's nothing more than just a mere moral work that she's doing. And any religious person can be submissive to her husband. But she needs to do it through her faith in Jesus Christ, her faith in God. And when we see this, it really shouldn't matter if she has a good husband or a bad husband. She is to submit to him. Why does she submit to him? God says because it pleases him. Because it pleases the Lord. 
This is what Sarah and other godly women have done as we continue looking at 1 Peter 3, the, the last two verses of this text I wanted us to look at. 1 Peter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Then it says, As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. So wives must find their ability to submit to their husbands, even in difficult situations, even when he's not making it easy for her to submit to him. She has to find her ability to do this through her trust in God. And then she can see her submission to her husband as really a physical representation of her submission to the Lord. And she is to build up a pattern in doing this, a pattern of submitting to her husband to where her husband can say, yeah, we, we may have conflict with each other, but I see my wife as she's making an effort to be sub to submit herself to me. So she is to build up a pattern in this and then trust and hope that the Lord would cause her husband to see it. Again, we see this in the scriptures there in in first Peter three, what we're looking at right now, look at verses one and two again. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word, without the wife's words, may be one now God is giving these wives hope. They can be one, one to the Lord, one to the right path of following the Lord, and then we'll see a, a marriage restored, that they can be one, or without a word, maybe one by the conduct of their wives, there in verse two. What does it say there? When they observe, so it's when the husband sees your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. So I'd encourage if there's any, any wise hearing me and they're in this difficult marriage through trusting in God, submitting to the Lord and submitting to her husband as a pattern is, is going on like this, ask the Lord to have her husband to, to see it, to see it. And then trust that the Lord would have her husband to be one as he sees this. So wise and difficult marriages can be encouraged that the Lord gives grace to them. We know in the scriptures, Timothy, Timothy had an unbelieving Greek father. We know that he was an unbeliever. Paul had to go and have him circumcised. The father didn't obey the word, didn't go according to the, the law of the old covenant. But Timothy had a believing mother and even a believing grandmother who taught him in the scriptures. So if you're married, you're to submit to your husband. This has to be the pattern of the wife to the husband all the time for the rest of your life. But in the same way, as a man needs to find a wife that he is willing to love for the rest of his life, I would say the woman needs to find a man, find a husband who she is willing to submit to for the rest of hers. And if you haven't been married yet, that is something to be mindful of. Find a, find a man, find a husband that you would say, I can submit to that man for the rest of my life. So I want to be clear with something that we see here in the scriptures that the woman is not told to be submissive to men in general. And men are not told to be in authority to women in general. The woman is told to submit to one man, not to all men. She is told to submit to one man, to her husband. It says that here in 1 Peter 3, 1 and 5, it says, be submissive to your own husbands. I like that word that's there, own, O-W-N. Be submissive to your own husbands. We also see the wife submitting to her own husband in our, our primary text, Ephesians chapter 5, in verses 22, 24, and 24, it says to be submissive, to, that she's to be submissive to her own husband. It says that also in Colossians three eighteen, to her own husband. We know the scriptures say in Galatians 3, 20, 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So men and women are all one in Christ Jesus. There is no authority structure just with men and women in general. There is no hierarchy. They are all one. They are all on level ground. No authority, no, no difference in authority. The wife is only told to submit to her husband. And then the scriptures also teach us that she is submissive to her husband 
or she submits to her husband so she can help him. The scriptures teach us that. In Genesis chapter 2.18, she is to be his helpmate. She is to be a helper to him. Genesis 2.18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable or fit for him. So she is to be her husband's helper. And her submission to him enables her to help her husband. Here's the other passage I want to look at. Titus chapter 2. You can turn there if you'd like. Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. And in this passage, we see how the, the wife is to help her husband. We don't see, I, I guess we don't see every area that she can be a help to him, but we see the, the primary ways, the fundamental ways in here, how she is to help her husband. In Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. It says, The older women likewise that they be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given too much wine, teachers of good, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So it says that older women are to teach younger women to be obedient to their own husbands. So if you are an, an older woman, and how would we categorize older women and younger women? Uh, one general way, of course, this doesn't work all the time, but one general way is if you're, we could say, if your youngest child is on average older, as old as or older than other women's oldest child, well, then you're the older woman. You have some experiences that you can help the younger women with. So if you're an older woman, it is good to be mindful of the younger women in the church who are struggling with their children. And not to be mindful of, of them in a way that you are judgmental about them or towards them. Not to have a critical attitude towards them, but to pray for them. And to be ready and willing to help them if that's what they desire. And then I would say if you're a younger woman, be mindful that there are older women in the church. Older women in the church who have gone through what you're going through. And they didn't do everything right, just like you're not doing everything right, because none of us do everything right. But these older women can pray for you. And they can give you valuable advice that can help you where you're at. Of course, I understand that there are different personalities within any church, and, and those personalities need to work well with each other for there to be close relationships and these close and helpful relationships. Now, what does this text tell us here that young wives are to be are to be taught? It tells what older women are to teach, or it says admonish the younger women. What is it that they teach them? Well, in here we see to be obedient to their husbands, again, as we see repeatedly. But we also see that they are to teach them to be discreet, to be chaste, to be homemakers, to be homemakers. There are times where the wife has to work. And I understand there are times where it is necessary for the wife to have to work, and, and, and she needs to do that. But I would encourage wives to work towards being at home. To work towards being at home. The scriptures say that this is God's design, to be homemakers. Work towards being at home. Why would I say that? And it's not just to be home for the sake of being home. There, there, there is a reason why. And it's to be home to be the helper of your husband. That's the reason why, to be a, a help to the husband. And, and this passage here gives us the, the most fundamental ways that she is to be a help to her husband. Here in Titus 2, 4 and 5, it says that the young women are to be taught or admonished to love their husbands, to love their children, and to be homemakers. So that's the primary reason why wives are to be home. It's out of being a helper to their husband, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be, to be homemakers, to take care of the husband's home, their home, take care of the ch their children, take care of their home, to serve her husband, to take care of the needs of her husband. And she can best do that when she is home, when she is there with them. If they don't have young children at the house, well, then she doesn't need to be there for, for the children. If, if uh, they don't have young children and, and it's okay with the husband and together as a couple, um, they think it's okay for her to go and work, well, then that's fine as long as it's not to the neglect of the home, as long as it's not to the neglect of the, of the husband and the children. 
But the idea is when there are young children, that mom needs to be accessible to them. She needs to be there with them. She won't earn a paycheck for doing that, but the benefits of it for the children are, 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 are wonderful. They're, they're more than money can buy. It's God's plan for mom to be home with her children. John Wesley, the famous preacher, Charles Wesley's brother, he said, I learned more about Christianity from my mother than from all the theologians in England. So we need godly mothers to raise our sons and daughters. If mothers have children, they don't need to seek a purpose out in the world. Their, their, their purpose that God has given them is right there in their children, in their children's lives. To raise their children to love God, to teach their children the scriptures, to teach their children about life, about decision making, how to deal with relationships, how to deal with, with, with winning and, and losing, how to deal with their own anger, their own sin, their own flesh. They need their, their moms to teach them this in a way that a stranger, even a well-meaning stranger, a stranger could never do it. Just the same way that mother and father can. Being a homemaker, we, we all know this, it's disrespected in the unchristian world. It's frowned upon. It's, looking, it's, it's looked at, at, at something that's, that's not something to brag about. It's supposed to be an embarrassing thing to the world. Even our current president, in 2021, he said this, Nearly 2 million women in our country have been locked out of the workforce because they have to care for a child or an elderly relative at home. He said that because he was trying to do some kind of plan or some kind of initiative to make childcare cheaper so that women can get out of their homes and go, and go to work, go to the workforce. But he was saying that they're stuck because they're busy taking care of a, of a relative. And they're stuck because they're busy taking care of their own children. And that goes directly contrary to what we're told there in Titus chapter 2. Directly contrary to what we have in the scriptures. Women, mothers are to have their children with them. Especially in these children's young and delicate years. I'll say that's why children are so messed up. Because they don't have access to their mother. They don't have access to their fathers. Fathers and mothers should always be there. We should never be too busy for our children. This goes for moms and it also goes for dads. If your phone rings and it's your son, it's your daughter, be sure you're too busy to answer that phone if, if, if you don't want to answer it. They need to, children need to know that they may not be able to get a hold of many people, but they can get a hold of mom and dad whenever they need to. So the mother isn't only to be at home. She, the, the scriptures don't say that she is only to be a homemaker, only to be in the house. As I said, especially when the children get older, especially when the children move out of the house. We read in Proverbs 31 about the godly woman. It says in verse 14 that she brings her food from afar. Well, she can't do that if she doesn't get out of the house. It says in verse 16, she considers a field and buys it from her profits. She plants a vineyard, so she's a businesswoman. She can get into business. She may be, be, she may be a better businesswoman than her husband is a businessman. So she, needs, she, she can do that if that's her desire, if that's their desire as a husband and wife. In verse 20, she extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. So she is active outside of the house, but not to the neglect of her home. As it says, again, still in Proverbs 31, I'm just breezing through these, in verses 27 and 28, she watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. There we have her household, there we have her children, there we have her husband. Her primary focus. That is, that is really what, what life is about. That is really what life is about for men and women. It's Having a family, it's being married, it's having children, unless you feel the Lord has directly called you not to do that. That's what it's about. Have a spouse, have someone you can give your life to, have someone you can love, have someone you can submit to, and have children you can love together and you can raise. It, it, it is difficult, but that is what God has called us to. Be fruitful and multiply from the beginning of the scriptures. That's what life is about. It's not gonna be easy, it's not gonna be perfect, it's going to be messy. It's going to be a lot of difficulty. It's going to be a lot of sin. But that's, that's what living is. That's what living is. And if, if you don't want to be married, if you don't want to have children because of money, that is a wrong reason. 
If you don't want to have children because of health issues, well, then that is a right reason. As you seek the Lord and, and you have a conviction not to, well, then that, that is a good reason. But if it's because of money, if it's because of convenience, if it's because you want to have a certain lifestyle to where you can't have children, that is a wrong reason. Living is having, is having a marriage and having children and doing that unto the glory of God. So the wife here, as we've been seeing, she's called to submit to her husband. And it says older women are to teach younger women. What, what do we see that older women are te to teach younger women? What, what else do we see here? It's, there, there's something in here that is, I don't think it's anywhere told in, in the scriptures. It says that she is to, the older women are, are to teach the younger women to love their husbands. And that's what we assume is true. We're to love one another. She is to love her husband, but... I don't see it anywhere directly taught about women, how they're to be towards their husband. This in the New Testament, directly spoken to wives. It says the older women are, teach the, are to teach the younger women to love their husbands. It says that here. So even though she's repeatedly told of, her, of, of the fact that she is to submit to her husband, there is this one occasion right here that she is told to love her husband. And, and this is what the marriage should be. It should be a, a, a unity of love. The longer that the two are married, the longer that the husband and wife are married, their love for each other should, should increase. Arguments should decrease. Arguments should become fewer and, and further apart. They should be quicker to forgive each other. The arguments should be, we could say, less damaging because we know that a lot of damage can happen during an argument. Of course, physical damage can happen if it gets to that point. But even verbal damage, people can say things that they would have never said if they weren't so angry and so driven by their emotion. They can say things that are so hurtful that would take a very long time to get forgiven, would take a very long time to get healed from. So these arguments should be fewer, further apart, less damaging in nature, and their love should increase. Their love should be evident. They should be quicker to forgive each other, quicker to show kindness to each other quicker to compromise for the sake of the other, quicker to give in, quicker to yield. And that goes both ways. That goes both ways. Wives yielding to husbands, husbands yielding to wives. There may be a time during arguments where, where the husband and wife need to avoid each other because it's getting so heated and they can't control their emotions, so they can't control what they're saying, so they do need to avoid each other. But those times of avoidance should be rare. Very rare. Only until, the, only until they're, they're, they're calmed down. They're no longer angry to where it's just controlling their actions. Avoidance for long periods of time is also detrimental to a marriage. Avoidance doesn't fix problems. It just causes it not to get worse. Then the husband and wife, and wife need to come back together to have restoration, to continue to love each other. So love should increase between the husband and wife. And the scriptures show that. So there's this emphasis, right? Where the wife is to submit to the husband, but then she's also to love him. There is a worse the other way too. And I want to deal with that from here for, for the rest of our, of our study. Look back with me at Ephesians 5. The, the few verses that go before our, our primary text. Our primary text is what? Verses 22 through 33. Let's look at verses 17 through 21. And here we see that even though the husband is told repeatedly that he is to love his wife, he is also told that he is to submit to his wife. So starting in verse 17 of Ephesians 5, this gives us what the spirit-filled life is to be. It says, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. And then this is what the spirit-filled life looks like. Starting in verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So this is what spiritual Christians are going to look like. It says speaking, singing, giving thanks, and submitting to one another in the fear of God. And then what is written after this, we could say, is an extension of what the spiritual life is. It goes on to say how husbands and wives are to be. And
But we see, according to this passage, that the husband being in an authoritative role to his wife doesn't mean that he is never to submit to his wife. It doesn't mean that. Especially if a husband has a very difficult time ever submitting to his wife, well, then he needs to heed what the scriptures say here. Because it says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. This is mutual submission. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. There is to be this gracious giving in to the needs and desires of each other. Christians are to be flexible with each other, to set aside their own personal convictions, their own personal desires for the better of the whole. This is the way it is in the marriage. It's also the way it is in the church. It's the way it is in any friendship, in any relationship, in any organization, in any group. Put aside your own personal needs, especially if they would cause unnecessary division. Put those aside for the sake of the unity and the better of the whole. Of course, mutual submission is not to confuse or to even negate the roles of authority and submission in the husband and wife and in the marriage. It's not to confuse that. But when it's done rightly, when it's done rare, when it's done in specific times where the Lord has, has led it to be this way, well, it would encourage the marriage. It would help the marriage. It would uh, Even husbands who think I could never submit to my wife because then she's going to run with that. No, watch. When your wife sees that you're humbling yourself, that you're being submissive even to her in this area that she's probably right in, that's why you're feeling like you should submit to her in this area. If, if you do that, it may encourage her submission to you. And, and it does that. The Lord does that. He works and he helps, but he wants to see us grow and he wants to see us humble ourselves. He wants to see us do what's right according to his word. So God's people are to have a general submissive character about them. But I'm not talking about being weak. This doesn't mean God's people are to be weak. When a weak person is submissive to a stronger person, there's nothing special about that. We understand that. He's weak or he has to submit or else he's going to get pummeled or defeated or ruined. That's not special. But when a strong person submits in an area where you think this, he wouldn't do that, well, that shows God's glory. That shows someone who loves God, someone who is actually looking at the scriptures and wants to honor God. That shows the Lord is working in people today. So when it comes to evil, when it comes to sin, believers are never to compromise. They are not to roll over and play dead. We see in Romans chapter 12, verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Ephesians 4, have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. We see in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, it says that the cowardly, and you know, it, it doesn't give us much explanation about that, but I'll just say the cowardly towards evil. The, the compromisers. It caused those who are cowardly towards evil, it says that they are just as guilty as liars. It's a sin, a sin that would damn someone to hell if they're not trusting in Christ, just like any other sin. Just being cowardly, not doing what the person is supposed to do. So I'm not talking about just being weak. I'm talking about what it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. So submission shows humility. It shows meekness. What did Jesus say in the Beatitudes about meekness? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Submission shows servanthood. Jesus said about servanthood, whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So Christians are to be strong in every way possible except for in sin. Christians are to be strong. They are to have a strong faith. They are to have a, a strong love for God. Ephesians 6.10 says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And in their strong faith, they are to have a submissive character about them, a servant-like character about them. Strong, servant-like Christians. That's what God calls us to be. So submission in its proper and its biblical context, it's, it's, it's not a hindrance. That's what we think. That's what the world would tell us. That sub to be submissive, that's, that's a hindrance. You can't accomplish anything that way. You're going to get run over, and those running over you, they're going to be the ones accomplishing things. But if it's done biblically and properly, it's not a hindrance. 
The wife's submission to her husband, that's not a hindrance. Children's submission to their parents is not a hindrance. When Christians submit to one another out of love for Christ, that is not a hindrance. There was a Scottish boy in China, and he was there in China. He was born in China, even though he was, he, he was Scottish, because his parents were missionaries. That boy's name was Eric Little. He became a professional runner, and he competed in the 1924 Olympics exactly 100 years ago this year. which It was in Paris that year. By the way, it's going to be in Paris this year again. He competed in the 1924 Olympics, and he won the gold medal for the 400-meter run. That wasn't even his main run. But he, he ran that one because it wasn't on Sunday, and his conviction was not to run on Sunday, and God honored his conviction. But he ran in that 400-meter run. It wasn't his main run. They thought it's, too, it's, it's not the 100-meter. He's not going to be able to accomplish it. God honors those who, 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 who honor him. And he, he won the gold in that. And we can imagine in, in the Olympics, the, the best athletes in the world both come and, and they compete in the Olympics. And he went home with the gold. Little submitted himself to a strict life. He was a professional runner. He didn't live the way most people do. He didn't eat the way most people do. He ate very little. He had a strict, specific diet. He ate healthy things that we would not like to eat. He ran a lot. He, he put himself in a rigorous kind of practice of, of running, of training. He submitted himself to this kind of lifestyle. And my point in, is, in this is that he was not hindered. If you would ask him, Eric, are, are you hindering yourself? Are you? No, I'm not hindered. I have to do this. This is what God has called me to. This was a godly, a godly man. He won the gold in 1924, and then a year later, he went back to be a missionary there in, in China. He had always wanted to go back, and he went back and spent the rest of his life being a missionary to continue on the work that his, his father did. Eric Little said, The secret of my success over the 400 meter is that I run the, fast, is that I run the first 200 meters as fast as I can. Then for the second 200 meters, with God's help, I run faster. <laughs> I love that. He was a submitted man who wasn't hindered. He also said in the dust of defeat, as well as in the laurels of victory, there is a glory to be found if one has done his best. So submission is not hindrance. And I'll just close with this thought. Submission brings about intimacy. It does. Submission brings about intimacy. When the wife is submissive to her husband, when she stops resisting him and fighting against him, intimacy is possible. And I'm saying when the wife is wrong and the husband is right. I mean, all the time, right? But especially in those times. Intimacy in the marriage is possible when she stops rejecting submission. And the wife, as a wife is to her husband, the wife's submission to her husband displays the church's submission to Christ in the same way when the church stops resisting Christ, when the church stops Ignoring Christ and ignoring the commands that Jesus gives the church. When the church yields to Christ and submits to Christ, intimacy with its Lord is possible. When the church quits rejecting and quits ignoring and quits disobeying and yields to its master and yields to the scriptures and yields to God's laws and the scriptures. When, 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 when Christians who love God and who love God's word stop rejecting God's word in areas that are difficult because it's, it's, it's something that the Christian has done. When, when, when the Christian says, you know what, I realize I'm doing wrong and I'm tired of this. I'm going to yield to the Lord here. The Christian can find intimacy in that place. Intimacy with his, with his God. Intimacy with her Lord. Intimacy with the one who, who, who loves him. That's where submission is correct. That's where submission is, is biblical. Submitting to those in authority over you that God calls you to submit to, especially those who love you and care for you, whether it's in the marriage, whether it's in the relationship with the church and its Lord. Submission brings about intimacy. As you submit to God, as you lean upon him, as you rest upon him and find your strength in only him and not yourself, intimacy is possible. Scriptures say, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Well, let's pray.